Welcome back to Studying Together. In episode 25, which happens to be the last episode in our study time together, we're taking a look at the subject, the gift of the Spirit. As we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for how you've been leading us through these studies. We thank you also for the fact that no matter whether we're seeing it or not, you continue to give in ways that we can't even imagine. Father, guide us as we study in this last session together. Bless us as we continue to look at your word, not just in this session, but even more after these sessions are done. Guide our studies. Bless us. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, whether we think about it or even look at it or not, God blesses us in immense ways that often we don't see and even more we don't consider. But they're in ways that continue to build us into the people he calls us to be. Now, this is not an easy way to go, but God continues to remind us that it is worth it and to keep faithful in the direction that he's leading us. Now, we've got a number of texts today that we want to take a look at in this session, so let's go ahead and get started. Our first text comes to us from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. In verse 14, Paul talking right here says this, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. One of the gifts that God gives us is the fact of having fellowship with each other. Now, this is not something that's normal, especially when it comes to to humans, because we'd rather tear each other apart, tear each other down, use each other as stepping blocks to get to where we're wanting to go. But God reminds us that he's put us together for a reason. And that reason is for fellowship, is for togetherness, if you want to call it that. And even more, to glorify him in and through everything that's going on. Acts chapter 5, looking at verses 3 and 4, says this. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Now that's something that we really don't take time to think about. You know, when you've given a promise, God tells you, you need to come through with it. There, There is very strong things when you don't come through with what you said that you're going to do. Now, with this situation, all he could have done at the beginning is said, you know, I know that I'm going to have a lot of money. I'm going to keep some, but I'm going to give some. If that's what he told them and made that promise to God, it would have been a different story totally. But because of the fact that he decided to lie to God, he paid for it with his life. John chapter 16, looking at verses 13 and 14, says this, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take from mine and will disclose it. To you. Right here, when we look at the subject of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, their togetherness is all about service. It's all about service because even before anything ever was, they were serving each other. We can literally say that that is God's love language, is service, and He wants to implant that in us. That is a gift that He wants us to grow so that we're becoming more like him in character. 
John chapter 14, looking at verses 16 to 18, says this. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, so that he may be with you forever. The helper is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I am coming to you. This is a very interesting verse because of the very fact that it's talking about another of the same. We often forget that the three have always been here. They're always working. It's a reintroduction of what the Holy Spirit is actually doing. And the very fact that he is still there. Even though, and this is a good thing that we need to continue to remember. Even though Jesus left, he did not leave us. Now, I'm not saying that his presence is only seen through the Holy Spirit. I believe that Jesus still appears. Jesus still comes to us. Now, with a lot of language that we look at from the biblical sense, we're seeing this in our perspective, in our language. But the divine is bigger than our language. And the words that we use to try to describe what has been told to us is nowhere near really what's going on. So there is a bigger picture that too often we're missing because we really don't know what's going on. First John chapter 3 and verse 24 says this, The one who keeps his commandments remains in him, and he in him. We know by this that he remains in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Right there again. God reminds us that he is with us continually. This is a promise that is not going to be broken, and he's not going to leave us ever. Not only that, when we continue to build the case into, into eternity, we see the fact that when it comes to the very end of time itself, when everything is reestablished, the center of everything that we know of as a universe will be here on this earth, and God will forever be with us. Now, right there, that is an amazing promise. Too often, we want to just push it aside and go, whatever. But it's not a whatever thing. It's a fellowship thing. It's a lasting thing, and it's an eternal thing. John chapter 16 and verse 8 says this, And he, when he comes, will convict the world regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. The whole fact of who God is, that is one of the biggest gifts that we can ever imagine, one of the biggest gifts we can ever receive. And literally, it is a gift. It's something that we don't deserve, but we're still given it. Which, that, that within itself should blow our minds. Too often, we want to write away everything that's going on, and we don't see what's really happening in the fuller picture. John chapter 15, we're going to take a look at verses 26 and 27. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, namely the Spirit of Truth, who comes from the Father, you will testify about me. And you are testifying as well, because you have been with me from the beginning. The only way that you can say anything about anybody is by being in their presence. The Holy Spirit is able to give a better picture to us about Jesus because the three have always been from even before anything ever was. Now that's something that's hard for us to imagine. But it's important that we're trying to imagine it, trying to see the bigger picture. But remembering that it is a bigger picture. The very fact that God has given us the Holy Spirit for a reason in that baptism that he places on us, gives us the gifts that we're needing in order to do the work 
that's done. Right here, Galatians chapter 5, looking at verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's an amazing verse right there for the simple fact that it's not just a list. This is something that you have to have the first before you go into the second. And it's something that continues to build upon itself so that we're able to be the people that God calls us to be. I encourage you to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Those, those chapters in that context give us a fuller picture of not only what the Holy Spirit's work is and the gifts that God promises to give us, but ultimately the concept that he is going to do what he says he's going to do. And even we see that in Luke chapter 11, verse 13. I encourage you to take a look at that as well. The very fact that when God says that he's going to do something, he just he doesn't just say something. There's a reason behind why he says what he says. Matthew chapter 12, looking at verses 31 and 32, says this. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven and whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. Jesus is saying this because the Holy Spirit is the one that interprets everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we pray into the presence of God. Now, we'll see in... Old Testament and New Testament, that all three are doing this together. And this concept is confusing to us because we don't understand the divine. And honestly, even through the ages of eternity, we still won't understand. But we are going to connect. But right here, the concept that's being pointed to is almost like a teenager to their parents where they go, whatever, plug their ears and just don't listen. We're spiritual teenagers many times, aren't we? Where we just kind of go, okay, whatever, God, I'm going to plug my ears. I don't need to listen to you. That's literally what, what he's talking about in the context of that text. Pushing him away so you don't hear now, God continues to try to work with us, to try to reason with us, until time itself ceases, ceases to exist. But here's the catch. There's only so much time. We don't know when our lives will be called for. We don't know when everything is going to come to an end. But that day is coming. And if we're not in God... We're not in Jesus. Our time will be ended like a flood, and that's it. We have no more time. We have no more hope because we've messed everything up fully and completely. We see this in our the very last text of our time together. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 says this, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Right there. Don't push him away. Don't ignore God. Because the time will come where that's it. There is no more time. There is no more hope. Because you have fully sealed the door shut. Right there we can say either we're sealed in God or we're sealed far away. We're with him forever, or it's as though we never existed. I don't know about you, but I want to be with the group that is forever remembered 
forever with him, not the one that is forever forgotten. Now, as you continue to study God's word, I want to encourage you to make sure that you're looking to Jesus, asking for the Holy Spirit to come and to interpret what you're reading, to interpret what's going on, so that you're able to stand firmly in him no matter what's happening in this world's history. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fact of what you are calling us to, what you're calling us in. Help us to be fully founded in you so that no matter what winds may come, we will not be shaken because we're surrounded by you. Guide us as we continue to go back to your word, as we continue to study these promises. And as we continue to ask you for your help, this is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. I'm sure that there will be questions that come up. I encourage you to go back, re-listen to this stuff, revisit these texts that we've taken a look at. If you have questions, feel free to send those questions to me. But as always, I encourage you to continue your study in the Word of God. Don't forget that this is important as we're studying and as we're sharing this with others around you. Till the next time, may God continue to bless you and guide you and continue on your journey as we continue to study God's Word together. God bless.